But now to the main event. And uh, the main event is quite a sad, uh, sad world affairs event that's now spanned two years, the war in the Ukraine. You know, it's uh, it's been something that most of us thought would last a matter of days or weeks when it first happened. And uh, it's now dragged on for for two years. As many of you know, the full-scale invasion by Russia uh, took place on the 24th of February 2022. Uh, the uh, Russians were actually in the chair of the UN Security Council, but their ambassador didn't know that the invasion had happened either. So it was obviously very closely guarded, and the, most of the UN Security Council only found out through the media what had happened. And obviously, uh, that sent shockwaves throughout the world. Uh, sadly, to date, some, some 500,000 soldiers and 30,000 civilians have died in the conflict over the last uh, two years. It's a complete humanitarian catastrophe and with global uh, geopolitical implications. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that many of you are here in the room and many more are online because this continues to be one of the big global issues of our time. Now, millions, billions, hundreds of billions have already been spent on this war, and there is still no end in sight. In year one of the war, 130,000 square kilometers changed hands in the war. In year two, only 900 square kilometers. So, you know, we are, uh, to some extent, as many commentators saying, at a, at a stalemate at the moment. And it's difficult sometimes to see what the, the future might hold. And that's why today is going to be, we're going to do this in, as a conversational piece rather than presentational piece. So Rajan and, and Paul, uh, I will ask them questions. They will come up with some responses to those before we throw it open to the audience during the Q&A session. Now, the way we'll do this, we'll do this in three parts, really. We'll explore, one, what happened in the last 12 months since our last get-together with Paul and Rajan. Then, secondly, what's happening right now. And then, thirdly, what are the possible trajectories uh, going forward? So, it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce both Paul and Rajan to you. Paul Danieri is Professor of Politics, Science and Public Policy at the University of California at Riverside. He studies politics in the former Soviet Union, focusing on the Ukraine and on Ukraine-Russia uh, relations. He's written an excellent book on this matter called From Civilized Divorce to Uncivilized War. Raja Menon is the Emeritus Professor in Political Sciences at the City College in New York. And his areas of expertise and research include American foreign and national security policy, global ethics, globalization, humanitarian intervention issues, international relations of Asia and Russia, and the other post-Soviet states. And again, he's also written an excellent book, uh, The Conflict in Ukraine, The End of the Post-Cold War Era. Again, something I would recommend uh, for all of you to read that. But please put your hands together for both Paul and Rajan. Thank you. Great to have you with us, Rajan and Paul, tonight. We'll start off with this first section. And my, my first question really is, is a very broad one. In your opinion, what are the sort of key uh, trends that have happened in the last 12 months since we last spoke? And probably over, we'll start with uh, Rajan, because you've been in the Ukraine, haven't you? Uh, yes, uh, four times, but most recently last December. Well, thank you for inviting us back for the third time, Andrea. So we must have done something right the first two times, otherwise you wouldn't have had us come back. Uh, let me start with a larger overview. So in 2022, when the war began, almost everybody that I know who had military expertise on Russia and Ukraine expected a quick Russian victory. In the event, the Ukrainians did remarkably well. They defeated the Russian assault on Kiev, pushed Russia from areas further north, Chernihiv province, from the northeast, Kharkiv, 
And then they moved um, south and took the right bank of the Dnieper River of Kherson. That was a spectacular campaign rolled up in one because it meant that Ukraine took back about 54% of the territory that it had lost. Now, your question was about what happened in 2023. Is the glass floor or ha or the glass half empty? On the one hand, the Russians on net have only gained territory that's about half the area of metropolitan Kiev, about 190 miles, give or take. Maybe a little bit more now because of the recent Vins and Avdivka and further west. On the other hand, and this is the big item, Ukraine's summer and fall counteroffensive did not work. And I know Paul would like to say something about this, so I won't go into the reasons of why it did not work, but I suspect that will come up in the discussion. So the, uh, the, the big problem for Ukraine was the failure of the counteroffensive. And it's a big problem, not only militarily, but it strengthened the hands in the United States of those who believe that continue to support Ukraine is futile, and it'll mean throwing good money after bad or bad money after good, whatever the saying is. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll um I'll pick up there if if that's all right. Um, yeah, the um the, you know, at this time uh, a year ago, Ukraine had withstood this original Russian assault and actually had it looked like was turning the tide in the war, and, and Rajan has made reference to all the territory that was regained in in different parts, um, and, and particularly regaining that territory in southern Ukraine, regaining control of the. Uh, right bank of the Dnipro River was a really difficult and important operation. Um, and momentum was on its side in the sense that the United States and Western allies were providing a lot of weapons um, and training to get ready for this big summer offensive, which as Rajan pointed out, there's there's no way to, to dress it up in any other way. That offensive failed. Um, you know, were there some maybe silver linings to it? It certainly um, held the Russians in check from doing other things elsewhere, killed huge numbers of Russian soldiers and so on, but it, it failed in its strategic purpose, which was to break through to the Black Sea, uh, thereby cutting off uh, Russian forces to the West and, and cutting off um, Crimea from its land supply route to, Ukraine, uh, to Russia. So that was a big um, defeat for Ukraine or, or victory uh, for, for Russia. You know, since then, um, the battle lines that have largely stabilized. And what both of you have said about territory changing hands is, is absolutely the case. Not a lot of territory has changed hands. Um, and yet, I would say, I don't think we're in a situation that I would call stalemate. In the sense that um, the, rel the number of soldiers deployed on both sides, compared to the, ex the, the length of the front, is actually small, which means that it's still possible that if somebody can bring some more soldiers to the fray, um, they'll be able to regain a local superiority. And that's what, of course, what Russia is now trying to do around uh, Avdivka. Um, so in contrast to, say, the Western Front in, in World War I in 1916, where you had millions of troops on this relatively short front from the, uh, you know, from the ocean down to the Swiss Alps, you have nothing like that in the current case. And certainly from the, the perspective of Russia, um, I don't think Russia feels like it's in a stalemate, right? Russia feels like it's winning and that it's going to win. And so that maybe will, will help us pivot into talking about what will happen next. Uh, but but the, yeah, it's it's not been a good 12 months for, for Ukraine after our first 12 months that were very bad for Russia. Andreas, can I quickly add a, a detail that might be useful to the audience? If you think of the front line in Ukraine, it's sort of like a crescent shape. I don't know if you can see my my fingers starting from northern Lugansk province, wending its way south, turning left, if you will, into Donetsk and Zaporizhia and uh, Kherson province. That's a fairly long front. This is where Russian numerical superiority in troops matters because they can mass a series of campaigns offensive campaign along different points of the front, forcing Ukraine to expend what is now scarce for them, artil ordnance, artillery in particular. 
Some like to poke fun at the Russian propensity for sending wave after wave of troops only to have them mowed down and for those behind them to step over dead bodies and fight them. And that is, in fact, a Russian tactic. The problem, however, is that for Ukraine is that each wave that comes at you, you have to shoot at it. And if you're the side that's lacking in ordnance, you are facing a big problem. So the biggest problem facing Ukraine now is not morale, not generalship, both of which are very good, but the real question of whether the United States will continue to support the Ukrainian military effort because Europe, try as it might, cannot fill the void. The United States has provided a slightly more in dollar value terms than all of its allies put together. Its departure would be, if not a crippling blow to Ukraine, certainly a very, very serious one. Okay, and I'm sure we'll get to that uh, as part of uh, part of this uh, panel. Uh, you alluded to the uh, the conscription to some extent already. There's a there's a bill in Parliament at uh, in in Ukraine going through to recruit five hundred thousand extra uh, soldiers, and and Russia is doing similar things, but also. Uh, uh, trying to employ mercenaries uh, as well as part of this. So uh, how do you see this panning out? Um, Andreas, I'm, I'm sorry to do this, but could you repeat the question? While you were talking, Siri on my iPhone decided <laughs> she wanted to say something, and I was panicking trying to shut her up. I think I've managed to do that. So if, you, if you'd be so kind as to just quickly recap the question. Yeah, no, of course, of course. I'm saying is uh, we talked about uh, the number of people uh, involved uh, in in the combatants uh, in this war, and uh, uh, the current stalemate where Russia may have the upper hand currently. Now there's a bill going through the Ukrainian Parliament to recruit 500 or conscript 500,000 people in Ukraine, and Russia are doing similar things and also uh, trying to recruit mercenaries. So, so how do you see this going? Maybe you first, Raj, and then go to Paul. So when I was at the front in December, in different parts of the front, I met soldiers who I've come to know over the course of the war. And there is no other way to put it than that these men, and they're largely men, who've been fighting at the front, some not just since February 2022, but since 2014. Remember, there's been a kind of continuing war in fits and starts, but nevertheless, a continuing war, they are worn out. They haven't seen their families or their friends for a very long time. They've seen comrades uh, injured and worse die, and they need to be rotated out. And when they hear that there are massive schemes in society to allow young men who would be eligible for military service to escape military service, this doesn't make them very happy. So there's a big question now about whether Ukraine can mobilize and train up between 350 to 500,000 troops, which given that it has a smaller population than Russia, would be hard. Now, I should hasten to add that the common view that the advantage is completely in Russia's favor because it has a much larger population overlooks a couple of things. If it has such a large population, why has it been using prisoners, private armies, warlord armies, and worse, recruiting from different parts of the world, India, Nepal, Cuba, various Central Asian countries? Yeah. My own view is that, yes, it has a much larger population, but Putin, after having done one mobilization, and I think September 2022, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, when about 200,000 Russians fled, and now that the casualties are mounting, yes, theoretically, he can put more people into battle, but he faces constraints of his own that the numbers may be misleading when it comes to figuring that out. I would just add to that, and I, I, I want to say I agree with everything that Rajan said, so I'll, I'll just add um, a, a few things. Um, so... Absolutely. Both of these countries now are struggling um, to to recruit more soldiers. And if you look at the sizes of their population, um, you know, they have the population. Even Ukraine, it's a country of 40 to 50 million people, depending on exactly how many have left. Um, you know, 
raising a, another few hundred thousand soldiers is not it's not mathematically impossible. It's a question of of will and and government policy. Uh, I do think it's one of the things that connects up with with American policy, which is um, a lot of this depends on confidence. And I think if there is at some point uh, a, an infusion of military support from the West, uh, I think Ukraine may find it easier um, to recruit more soldiers. Um, but we'll we'll have to see. But it's absolutely the case. Um, Putin does not really want to put conscription in place in the cities um, because he's he's afraid of how people will react. And so that becomes an inherent limit. In Ukraine, it's a little bit more interesting. In Ukraine, there are a lot of people who have received military training in the past um, who have not been brought back in. Now, some of them are fairly uh, advanced in years. And so there, there's questions about this. But the other thing that's been really interesting in Ukraine is so far... They have not um, conscripted a lot of people in the ages between, say, 18 and 26, which is interesting because in the United States, that's the first group of people we look to, right? When I was 18, I had to sign up to be eligible for the draft or I couldn't receive any aid to go to university. Um, Ukraine has had this idea that that's sort of the, the, the best of their young men. They don't want to send off to war yet. The, to me, that seems very counterintuitive. But it also means that um, if they are able to pass a conscription bill, there are a lot of able-bodied young people um, who have not yet been brought into the Ukrainian military. And, and so it really is a, um, an interesting political task for the Ukrainian government now to uh, craft a, a, a conscription bill which strikes enough people as fair um, that people then uh, uh, sort of accept their, their duty and go do it rather than trying to avoid it. And that's a tall order. Yeah, and and to some extent, it's about patriotism and also about commitment and mm -hmm. and uh, how feeling how 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 the war is going. Uh, yeah. In your opinion, and we'll start with you, Paul. What has changed in the mood of the Ukrainian and Russian people, not the combatants, but the actual people over yeah. the last twelve months? Uh, I think in Ukraine, there everybody I talk to, it's uh, and Rajan already already mentioned this. Everybody I talk to, um, there's the there's I think of the same sense of there's weariness. Um, this has been going on for two years, and it's hard for us. It's certainly hard for me sitting where I sit to really, you know, wrap my head around the um, the trauma people have experienced, the exhaustion they're experience, uh, just the whole range of of emotions. Um, at the same time, and I ask about this all the time whenever I talk with my friends there, um, the um, the appetite to cut a deal with Russia is absolutely not there yet. And so there's this sort of paradox, which is they don't necessarily all want to rush off to the front and fight and die, um, but nor do they want to surrender. And and so so you know something's going to have to have to give uh, there. In Russia, I think it's a little bit different. Um, Putin's strategy. We just sort of talked about this. Putin's strategy has been to fight this war without having it become a major part of everybody's lives. And unless you're in a place like Belgorod, which the Ukrainians have been shelling from time to time, I think the average Russian gets to live their lives with this war being fairly distant um, from their reality. And that's what Putin is counting on. Uh, they will see it in, in prices and shops being marginally higher. Some goods they used to buy from the West aren't available and so on. Um, but I don't think it's a, it's a, a really important day-to-day -day fact in the lives of most Russians. Okay. No, let's let's turn then to to what's happening now and uh, in in terms of uh, weariness in the west of continuing to support uh, Ukraine what what difference do you think will the EU commission's approval of 50 billion uh, euros over four years make to Ukraine right now um in the short term very little it's not that 50 billion euros is a trivial amount but because of complicated reasons, primarily the ability to rely on American protections for multiple generations and to have a fairly substantial welfare state and not to address the guns versus butter problem, the Europeans have allowed their defenses to be neglected. They now realize that it's at least conceivable that Trump could be in the White House and that even if he's not and Biden is elected, but doesn't control the Congress, especially the House of Representatives, which he doesn't now control, that aid to Ukraine may not be forthcoming. So the Ukrainian, the Europeans, the, their minds have been concentrated. Macron went off script the other day and said, well, it's time to talk about perhaps European troops 
of going to Ukraine, and every European leader tried to run away from that as fast as they 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 could ma uh, manage. I don't think there's any chance of that happening. Germany and Poland are already on record, the two one of the two biggest countries in uh, in Europe, uh, that uh, that that will not happen. So Europe cannot backfill, as it were, the gap that the American departure uh, will create. Um, Andreas, may I just quickly add a detail to what Paul said about the mood in both countries? Um, would that be okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. So um, whenever I've gone to Ukraine, I've asked soldiers, citizens of all sorts, from hotel clerks to people in the government, do you think the pain has gotten so bad in terms of economic privation, in terms of death, in terms of destruction, that as much as you don't want to do this, it's time to look for some kind of compromise with Russia? I've yet to meet a single person who has said to me that that time is now. So what Paul says has been my experience. Russia is a little tougher to figure out that is, what is the depth of support for the war in Russia? I think it's wrong to believe that Putin stands atop Russian society with a whip hand, and were it not for that whip, nobody would support the war. I think the war does have some support among Russians. What we can't tell is how much. So some could support it because they are Russian nationals, and they believe that their country is at war, and it is because of NATO expansion that their country is at war, and there's a rallying around the flag effect. That happens in many countries, including, including my own, as, as Paul can attest. Then there may be some people who have just tuned out. They may feel one way or the other way about the war, but life is complicated and they're getting on with their lives and they're not worrying about the war. Because as Paul mentioned, uh, in point of fact, in the big cities, Russians can actually pretend that the war really hasn't happened. There may be others who oppose the war, but wonder whether it is worth the risk going on to the street and protesting because the government has made it quite clear that those who do so will be believed. And then there's a final category of people who hook, line, and sinker have bought the government's narrative. And while they may not have particular reason to support the war, the news that they get tells them that they ought to do it. I don't know how to categorize the proportions of these various groups, and we're not in a position to carry out surveys, and I personally am actually banned from going to Russia. So uh, it's not possible for me to ask the kind of questions of Russians that I've asked Ukrainians. But it is an interesting question um, about on the Russian side about exactly what is the degree of support. Okay. I mean, that's quite interesting on the basis that uh, if the Russian people themselves aren't affected by the war to the same extent, obviously, as the Ukrainians, uh, and some of them are potentially positive towards it, uh, the whole point at the beginning when Western sanctions, economic sanctions happened against Russia, why do you think they have not been effective? Because they're not, they're not evident on the streets of Moscow or elsewhere. You know, the shops aren't empty. People don't find it particularly difficult to, to get goods. And the IMF have actually upgraded their growth targets, uh, estimations for, for Russia in the coming year. So what's, what's gone wrong as far as the sanctions is concerned? That's a really good question. And I think there's going to be a lot of people like me writing books on this in the years to come. Um, but, but let me try. And it's very, the answer is very complicated. Let me just summarize a couple of big things. First is the sanctions themselves were limited because the Europeans were not entirely and still are not ready to entirely wean themselves off of Russian energy. So there were important limits. Um, secondly, uh, there's a lot of other countries around the world um, and private actors who are more than happy um, to do business with Russia, especially uh, if, if they can buy oil and gas a bit more cheaply than before. Uh, India in particular has been taking huge advantage of this. Um, there are other countries that want to make sure that Russia um, does not do too badly in this war. China is very prominent in that category. Uh, but finally, I think we also have to point to the, the Russian Central Bank um, and the leadership of the Russian Central Bank, who did a really um, uh, skillful job in the first days and weeks to prevent uh, the Russian currency from collapsing, uh, creating macroeconomic stabilization. Uh, the result is which the, 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 the sanctions have had the effect of essentially a massive deglobalization of the Russian economy, uh, 
Um, so prices go up. Uh, people are paying a lot more for goods and so on and so forth. But those are qualitative changes. Uh, not, not, I'm sorry, those are quantitative changes. Things are getting more expensive, but it's not forcing the economy to collapse and it won't force the economy to collapse. What it will mean is that in the long run, Russia is going to fall further and further behind economically. So it's a disaster for Russia in the long term, especially as Russia is going to become more and more a vassal of China, which is not going to make the Russians very happy. But in the short term, it's not going to force them to change the war in any way. Uh, I agree. Let me just add very quickly that there's a large literature on sanctions. And if I can summarize it very crudely, it says the following. But if there's a government that for whatever reason is hell bent on doing something, economic punishment itself won't force it to change course, at least in the short run, because it is priced in that punishment, right? But as Paul said, there's a short term and a long term. In the short term, the idea that the Russians will give up the war because the economic situation has become so bad that they can't stand it. And that's not the case. As Paul pointed out, they have found various workarounds. Uh, in the long term, because of the number of Western companies that have pulled out, because of declining Western investments, because of the cutoff of high-tech technology transfers, even to the oil industry, over time, Russia will begin to have a problem. Run this experiment, members of the audience, when you go home. Go to your home or go to the homes of your friends and look around and see how many products made in Russia you see. You will see South Korean products, you'll see British products, you'll see American products, Japanese products, likely even Indian products, but you won't find very much by way of Russian products. So it is already an economy that depends very heavily on raw material, oil and gas in particular, and arms with not much else to show. And that problem will be exacerbated in the long term. But as Lord Keynes said, in the long term, we're all dead. For Ukraine, it's a question of short-term survival. And so uh, sanctions are not going to save it, nor, as uh, uh, some believe, will there be a kind of fantasy of a grassroots rebellion that will overthrow Putin and yeah. bring world win. And I see absolutely no evidence of that happening. That's not to say it couldn't happen tomorrow, but they, I can only go by the evidence I see. And I see no evidence that the war has created a level of dissatisfaction where he faces some kind of mass uprising. He's managed to co-opt opposition, to repress it, and also to arrange the war in a way that it only touches Russian society fairly lightly. Okay, thank you for that. I've just got a note uh, message come through from Anthea saying, sanctions don't work. So let's move swiftly on to aid. Uh, yeah. The US Senate has just approved $60 billion worth of military aid for Ukraine, which is currently uh, with Congress. What are your views in terms of how likely this is going to be passed and how soon will that military aid actually be available to Ukraine? Um, shall I take this first, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good whenever, luck. Whenever non-American audiences ask me about the politics of my own country, my hand, my instinct is to throw up my hand in despair because, frankly, I can't understand what's going on here anymore. And I say that not in a flippant manner, but I think there's... There's some changes that have occurred in the way we talk politics and certainly in the way we practice politics that are deeply disturbing. So it's actually $66 billion in aid totally, of which 44, 45 billion is military aid. But uh, for reasons having to do with the peculiarity of the way our legislature works, if the, the Senate's approved it, the House is likely to approve it, but only if Speaker Johnson allows the vote to take place on the floor of the House of Representatives. So there's literally one man holding in the palm of his hands the fate of the war and the fate of Ukraine. Now, you might ask, why is Johnson doing this? And the simple answer is that he is very beholden to Trump but he, he needs the support of members of the House of Representatives who are beholden to Trump. And the more it looks like Trump will be the nominee, as you all know, he just uh, severely uh, uh, won overwhelmingly 
against Nikki Haley in her own state of South Carolina and yesterday in Michigan by a huge margin. We have a whole series of primaries coming up next Tuesday, I believe, called Super Tuesday. And he's liable to win all of them, and Nikki Haley will be out of commission. The more it looks like there could be a Trump presidency, the more the MAGA, Make America Group legislatures, will dig in their heels and refuse to approve the uh, the aid bill. So I'm not optimistic. I will say that I personally support providing Ukraine uh, aid. Americans have been through a lot of failed wars lately and have become jaded with wars. But there is such a thing as a war that's strategically important and, and morally just, and I think this is one of them. Yeah, let me let me just a- add briefly, um, a couple bills previously that would have included aid to Ukraine, um, uh, the, the previous one would have had aid for both Ukraine and Israel. Um, they have come within a whisker of of making their way through the House of Representatives. And, and as Rajan points out, it basically is just going to take a, de- a deal getting done. In the previous one, they thought the deal was getting done and it fell apart at the last minute. So on the one hand, um, it's very, very close to happening and it will be really important when it does. On the other, um, the the Republican majority in the House of Representatives is so slender that a very small number of people can, can hamstring things and they are determined to do so. So, um, so I actually, I'm... I wouldn't call myself optimistic that this bill or some subsequent similar bill will go through, um, but I think it's a real possibility. And and if it does, it changes the game considerably. Okay, let's assume it does uh, get passed uh, in yep. Congress. Um, how much of this will make a difference this year in terms of actually provision of military aid and hardware arriving yep. and the kind of hardware that Zelensky actually wants, you know, the fighter yep. planes, the F-16s, etc.? So let, let me jump in on this one um, because I have a strong opinion, um, which is uh, these things take time, right? It takes time to 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 actually d- deliver the stuff, even if it's just sitting in a warehouse somewhere. But I think the whole problem with the Western approach to this war from the beginning has been we've been thinking in short terms. There were a lot of people that said right after February 2022, the Western Europeans need to start ramping up their defense production. And the, and the Americans need to start ramping up their defense productions of things like artillery shells. And nobody wanted to do it because they thought, well, we'll hope that this war ends soon. This war has not ended soon, and I don't think it's going to end soon. And I'll just give my opinion. I don't think this war, I don't think anything is going to happen decisively in this war in 2024. We're now playing for 2025. And my view is, and this is, I'm going to get out on a limb a little bit. My worry about 2025 is that the Russians are able to uh, conscript and train up and equip enough soldiers that they can put another big batch of them in Belarus and attack southward to Kiev, towards Kiev, in the spring of 2025, you know, without having to cross the Dnieper River and so on. Um, the, the point is, this is, um, this is not a war that's going to end soon. And whoever that it plays the long-term game best is going to win. And so it doesn't matter that a lot of this material won't show up this year. What matters is that it shows up by the time the Russians are able to get a bunch of new forces in the field. Okay, well, let's. Uh, I think that's a good point, Paul. Let's go from the let's go from the short term to the longer term. Yep. What What do you both feel is the extent of the West's commitment to the Ukraine going forward? We're talking years now rather than months. Yep. Rajan, you're on mute. You have muted yourself, so you need to unmute. Well, I don't know whether I can unmute you. Uh, Bear with me one second. Let me just click that back on. One second. It's not easy doing the the security... Well, check settings in maybe I'll time. maybe I'll chip in here while while you're sorting that through. No, no, but, um, yeah, but, but I think Rajan, you should be able to unmute now. Try it. Oh, there good. Go. So I was coughing and I didn't want to disturb the audience, and then it said only yeah. the host can unmute me. So I, I'm 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 back. You're back. Uh, I agree with everything that Paul has said. This is a long war. We didn't think it would be a long war. First, we thought the Russians would win very quickly. Then the Ukrainians were doing so well. We thought that they would win and there would be a successful counteroffensive. It's going to be a long war. The immediate problem is not F-16s. 
even had they been provided during the counteroffensive, the Ukrainians didn't ask for enough to provide a comprehensive air umbrella that would have made a difference. If I had to mention one thing in which there is a huge deficit, well, two things. One is artillery. The Russians have about an eight to one advantage. In the battle for Avivka, that made a huge difference. The Ukrainian army had to withdraw because it was being pummeled by artillery without any way to respond. The other big problem is drones. The Russians are seen as lumbering and clumsy, but they have adapted and become much better at certain things. In particular, they have uh, put into place a large drone building program. It used to be that they were relying on Iranian Shahid drones. Now the Shahid drones that they have are made in Russia and are modernized, but they have a whole array of drones including FPV drones. FPV drones are uh, front-facing drones where you look like you're in the cockpit and you can see what's going on and you can target things. So they've been very, very good. But uh, Ukraine has been very good with its drones. The problem is that as of now, about 80% of the drones used by the Ukrainian army are privately sourced. You cannot run a war like that. So those two critical areas could be done. But to give you an example of Paul's point about the lag in uh, European defense spending. The Europeans were supposed to provide Ukraine 1 million artillery shells, which is nothing compared to what the Russian production levels are. 1 million by this March. They haven't provided even 50% of that. And the best estimate of when the 1 million will be provided is by the end of this calendar year. That's way too long to wait in a war that is artillery heavy. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so I think uh, moving on to the next thing, and we alluded to this already, and that is, what would a Trump White House do to affect the war in Ukraine? I'm, I'm, um, I'm very curious about this, and I'll be curious to hear what Rajan has to say. Um, but I always, I would point out that it's really easy to promise things and to make sweeping statements when you're a candidate. And it's it's sometimes much more difficult to do things um, or to deal with things when you're president. And so as a candidate, um, Trump has been has treated the possibility of Ukraine losing this war with alacrity. He seems not much to care. All he really cares about is kind of making this uh, uh, this sort of isolationist pitch, right? America first. Um, if he becomes president in Ukraine, really begins to lose the war in earnest on the ground, and we see the kind of atrocities that the Russians are going to perpetrate, there will actually become immense pressure on him to do something about it. Um, and he will perceive it because he doesn't like to think of himself as a loser. And he may think that he can cut a deal with Putin, but he can't cut a deal with Putin um, because Putin wants more than uh, than anybody really is going to be willing to give. And so um, just as Barack Obama said he was going to close Guantanamo Bay and never quite managed to do it, I, I I do I wonder whether Donald Trump as president might find himself compelled to do more for Ukraine than he really wants to. Maybe that's a bit, being a bit too optimistic, but it, but I think it's a possibility. Yeah, uh, Andres. Um, before I answer the Trump question, just very quickly, Mr. Ford, one of the members in your audience, put a very interesting statistic on on the board, in which he says correctly that the Russians have lost about in death and, and casualties about three hundred fifty thousand soldiers. That's the best estimate I have, and it comes from British intelligence, which I think has the best numbers on this. So we have to be cognizant of the fact that while Ukraine is in for a rough sledding, the Russians have suffered significant casualties. Uh, women who are the girlfriends of soldiers or the wives of soldiers have been told by the Russian government to tell their boyfriends or their spouses not to talk about supply interruptions and various problems, right? Uh, Russian dead bodies come back in in the stealth of night. Beyond the loss of men, there has been a significant loss of equipment. Geolocated data, which is very conservative, shows that about 14,000 pieces of Russian military equipment has been lost. And whereas the tank balance was vastly in favor of Russia at the beginning of the war, at the moment, Russia and Ukraine have roughly comparable amounts of tanks. So we should not shortchange the fact that this has been a very tough war for Russia. I would say that if American aid comes through, it may not make an instantaneous difference, but it will keep Ukraine in the fight. I don't believe it's ever possible for Ukraine to take back all the territory it's lost, certainly not Crimea, but that's not the game. It really is staying in the war long enough so that Mr. Putin is convinced 
that he cannot eke out the kind of victory that he wants to do. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, there's obviously some uncertainty around uh, what will happen if Trump does become president in terms of the effect on the Ukraine. Let me let me ask a, a slightly different question. What will Europe have to do to take up the slack if America's commitment to the Ukraine isn't as continues to be as strong as it has been? What does Europe need to do to fill the gap? Yeah, well, well at the risk of being candid, and I say this as somebody who uh, supports the Ukrainian cause for reasons I've explained. At the end of the day, because of a large body of water that separates us from the European continent, this war will be more consequential strategically and in terms of security for Europe than it will ever be for the United States. And I think it is possible for the US, and I'm not advocating this by any means, to wind up this war and go back home. If Ukraine loses, it will mean that in effect, Poland, will have Russia as a neighbor, right? And that has follow-on effects for the rest of NATO. I'm not one who believes, especially after the dismal showing of the Russian army, that Putin can march into NATO countries and start a war with them and hope to prevail. But I think the Europeans are at a stage when they have to make a very big decision. If Trump comes to the White House and cuts Ukraine loose, I'm not saying that that will necessarily happen. It's hard to know with Trump. Uh, and if American military aid ceases and Ukraine is more and more on the back foot, how quickly can they take the action needed to keep Ukraine in the fight? For complicated reasons, it won't be easy, but I think now they have realized that they are at a turning point where they have to take some really drastic measures. Measures short of sending their own troops, but measures that require ramping up production to to uh, support Ukraine. The problem is that you can't suddenly start ramping up production of heavy equipment. Right. Yeah, European security for the since the end of the Cold War has been based on two assumptions. One was that trade with Russia would mean that Russia would never attack. Uh, Russia would, was a status quo power. And the other was that the Americans would would stick around. Um, both of those things are, are now deeply in, in question. Russia has proven to be aggressive despite uh, uh, all the trade that was being done and the United States, um, as it has been, you know, threatening to do really for 50 years now is now seriously thinking about packing up and going home. Um, so absolutely. And, and one of the things about this is it's actually probably in terms of what, uh, what the European union and its member countries, uh, and the UK will be required to do will probably be just as expensive, um, if Ukraine loses this war, than it would be if the if the West uh, if, if Europeans were to give Ukraine the help it needs to win the war, um, because exactly um, um, uh, a a Russia that now has a long border with Poland and is empowered and is now worried about what's going on on that side of the border um, is going to be one that is going to need to be met with serious military. One of your your questioners point uh, pointed out, and I think this is a crucial point. Um, that in important respects, this is not just a war um, about territory, right? This is a war about ideals. Um, it's become a very ideological war. It's Russian authoritarianism against Western liberalism. And that's not going to end when when and if Russia conquers Ukraine. Um, and so so if the Americans go home, then then Europe has to take on Russia by itself. And that's going to require some fundamental changes, including just to scare everybody a little bit more if I haven't done it well enough is is sooner or later the West the Germans have to think about their own nuclear arsenal right if the United States pulls out okay so we're basically back back in history so Fukuyama's the end of history uh, clearly we're back in the Cold War era yeah. with the vengeance the the difference Absolutely. I suppose is that uh, it's no longer just America Europe and 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 Russia there's some new players on board here, so China and India, for example. Mm -hmm. What role do they have to play in the in the likely outcome of of this war? Well, China is in a very advantageous position because it's got the West consumed, and the United States in particular, in a land war in Europe, not directly but indirectly. It has also positioned itself in a very favorable position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, because Russia is now dependent on China in a way that I can't uh, remember ever 
That is not a good position for Russia to be in. Think about yourself as a Russian leader. Do you want to be cut away, cut adrift from the West with no prospect of normalization anytime soon? By the way, I think that it's going to take a very long time before anything approaching normalcy is restored between ourselves and uh, the, the West and, and Russia. Do you want to be at the tender mercies of the Chinese when, if you look from the 19th, history, 19th century, the Russian-Chinese relationship has had its ups and downs. And if you talk to people in China, especially people in positions of authority, at rock bottom, they have a certain contempt for the Russians. They may not like the United States and Europe, but they have a certain respect for it. Not so Russia. Now, the big game in town that the Russians can provide China is um, oil and gas. But China is going gangbusters in electric cars and green energy. And over time, that Russian asset will be a diminishing asset. There are two pipelines, one in the works, one done, called the Power of Siberia from Russia to China. And the, the Chinese signed off on Power of Siberia 1, and it's up and running. Power of Siberia 2, they're dragging their feet. They're not quite sure that they, they want it. I think that's very, very telling. Uh, North Korea, well, uh, it loves to be needed, and it's certainly needed now in terms of the artillery that it's giving Russia. Uh, it's very interesting that despite all we hear about the Russian capacity to ramp up production, they're turning to North Korea for uh, artillery shells and Iran for drones. North Korean artillery shells are notoriously inaccurate, but they are still deadly. Uh, India, well, India has a long history with Russia, uh, going back to the 1950s. And most Indians regard uh, Moscow as a tried and trusted friend. Their relationship with the United States has been up and down, recently quite good. But they have what economists call sunk costs with Russia. They're not about to throw it overboard uh, dramatically. They have been major beneficiaries of Russian oil uh, purchases because they've been able to purchase at bargain basement prices. And they've helped the Russians. Oddly enough, the United States hasn't sanctioned India because the U.S. looks to uh, looks at India as a potential ally, wrongly in my view, uh, as an ally against, against China. So the Indians are not in a bad position. They've been able to sort of reap the benefits of the war without suffering any of the consequences for it, of it. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I'd just say I, I agree with everything. I think there's been one um is war has been hugely advantageous for China, especially um, um Russia's Russia's being forced to become a client state of China slowly but surely. Um the one cost to China is its trade with Europe. Um by by backing Russia in the war um as much as it has, it's really highlighted to Europe the dangers of its relationship with China. And, and so so that's Europe uh, has sort of become leery of trade with China uh, in a way similar to the way that the United States has. Um, but China is still going to have a really important role to play, I think, if and when, and I think this is a long way down the road, but um, if we get to the point where negotiations over some kind of ceasefire or peace deal become serious, um, I think at that point, uh, China may be able to provide a nudge that might get Russia over the line um, on agreeing to something. Um, it, certainly, China is, I think, the only power outside of Russia that can have any kind of real influence on Russia. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we need to throw it open to 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 the right. audience, both online and and here in the room, very soon. I have one final final question for both of you, and it is: How much of an existential issue is the war, not just for Ukraine, but the world as a whole? Mm. Uh, 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 Andreas, uh, I will answer that, or I'll try to. It's a difficult question, but I want to keep in mind two questions that I see on the board, one from Mr. James and one from Ms. Norman Taylor. Both are good questions, and, I, and, I, and I'll come to them. I, I, I'm seeing them. Uh, existential, I mean, if Ukraine is defeated, will it fundamentally transform the global balance of power? No. Will it have significant implications for the way Europe thinks about security moving ahead. Yes, large part of the world, the so-called global south for the most part, doesn't have a big stake in this war. And there's not little sympathy for the Russian cause in many of these countries. Some of it is pragmatic, some of it is ideological, some of it is the belief that the West bears its share of blame for having triggered this war, what, whatever the reasons. But I, I don't think this is something 
equivalent to what we saw in the 1930s and 1940s, where a war was afoot that could have changed the nature of the, of the global order. Um, its consequences will be largely limited. There are those who argue that if Ukraine wins, Chinese will say, aha, the West has uh, no guts, and so we can invade Taiwan. I think Chinese are not that stupid. I mean, they will look locally at the balance of forces. They will look at the risks to their economy. They are very tightly meshed with the global economy of going to war. They're not just going to say, oh, well, Ukraine lost the war, so now we can invade Taiwan, because they're very serious consequences that they will be cognizant of. And I think the local balance of forces, rather than the outcome of the Ukraine war, will be much more de decisive to any Chinese decision to move on on, uh, on on Taiwan. I also think that it's not accurate to say that the next step of Mr. Putin is to attack NATO. Remember that two countries that had no interest in joining NATO whatsoever, but who have fine armies, uh, uh, Finland and Sweden, have not joined NATO, thereby complicating vastly the problems of the Russian Baltic fleet, which have already been considerable. So I think uh, my own sense is the, the consequences will be limited, not for Ukraine. It is a life or death battle for them. And Paul? Yeah, I'll just add, I, I, I agree with this in general. I think this is a much, much, much more important war for Europe than it is for, for the rest of the globe. Um, and in some important ways, it is an existential crisis for Europe. Um, uh, the, the you know the combination of uh, Brexit and the and U.S. isolationism and this war um, really has the possibility of, of of transforming the 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 security and political uh, architecture in Europe. Um, in particular, uh, you know something I don't think people have paid enough attention to is if Russia wins this war, there's going to be uh, you know the word genocide gets thrown around too loosely. Let's just say there's going to be mass mass killings of Ukrainians, right? Thousands upon thousands of Ukrainians are going to be killed in the war process itself, but also the Russians have made lists, right? Um, concomitant with that is then is going to be millions of Ukrainians fleeing westward. R you, you, uh, the uh, Ukraine or you, Europe will have an enormous, enormous refugee crisis. Handled it very well in 2022, but probably that many people again, I'm guessing, right? Headed westwards into Poland, Hungary, and so on and so forth. So the challenges for Ukraine in the short term in terms of how do we deal with mass killings? How do we deal with the refugees? And then in the long term, how do we think about the security of, of Europe in, and so on? Transformative, I think. Okay, well, thank you for that. So I think to summarize, I suppose, uh, the war in Ukraine isn't just an existential issue for the Ukraine, but for the whole of Europe, certainly and potentially will spill over well beyond Europe into other parts of the world. Yeah. Now, I think uh, before we get into the Q&A session, Paul and, and, and Rajan, I just wish that the audience uh, can just show their appreciation for some really deep oh. insights into the current situation in Ukraine. Thank you. Good. Well, it's open to... To, to the audience now. So I think we'll start in the room and then we make our way uh, to online. So if yeah, we you have some good questions in the chat. Yeah, I noticed there are two questions in the chat that with your permission, I will address whenever you think it's appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. So one is from Mr. Jane. Bernie Sanders and... today addressed Congress and, uh, about Gaza and he must have absolutely shamed them. I mean, he's far more intelligent than the other two. And the other thing is, uh, America, um, when America stops funding the, funding the war against the Palestinians, they'll have a bit more money. And one more thing, um, uh, Navalny's wife today gave a speech, and she, she committed herself against Putin. And then she went and talked to Ursula van der Leyen. So presumably, there, there's some sort of contact that might make differences. Did you hear that, Chaps? Yes. Um, so, so very quickly, um, I think you're quite correct that if the money that the US is giving to fund Israel's war in Gaza were given to Ukraine, it would make a big difference. But the, the, the president can't simply do that with congressional, without congressional approval. That's number one. Number two, and much more importantly, there's not a chance at all whatsoever, zero, 
that President Biden nor any other American president is going to cut off uh, aid to Israel. I am not a supporter of the Gaza war. I'm quite sympathetic to what the Israelis went through on October 7th. But what has happened since then, I think, is is uh, uh, is not something that I'd like to, to see the United States associated with too closely. Um, so, so, Mr. James, you've asked about the A-10 aircraft. Why aren't the Americans giving them? Surely these would be better than the F-16. So uh, you probably know this, but for the others who may not, um, uh, the A-10 is a, is a tank killer. Uh, it is not a fighter bomber, which the F-16 is. It's an air superior or the aircraft. The A-10 Warthog would make a difference except that its mission has largely been fulfilled by Ukrainian drones that have been very good at taking out uh, Russian armor. So they're not in dire need of that. The F-16 is actually quite an old aircraft. And if some were provided to Ukraine, it's supposed to be later this year, it might make a difference. I would much rather Ukraine get the uh, the Swedish Gripen aircraft. Uh, Ms. Norman Taylor, um, sanctions haven't worked uh, because the global south deals extensively with Russia. I'm sorry, I'm doing violence to your good question by summarizing it. Uh, I think that's true, but I think overwhelmingly when it comes to the things that Russia really needs, like investment and technology transfer and trade, Overwhelmingly, it's with the West that it, from the West that it wants those things. If you look at Russia's trade with India, for example, despite all the talk of boosting up the numbers, it's quite small. Russia's trade with China is actually quite small. There's been talk by both Russia and China, but especially Russia, about de-dollarization, moving away from the dollar as a uh, currency with denominating value and storing it. Uh, there's been very little uh, evidence that very countries are are eager to do that. So yes, it does matter that the global South is willing to deal with Russia and not to fall in line and sanction it. But in the grand scheme of things, the bite of sanctions um, imposed by the West uh, should not be minimized because of that. And the global South is not in a position to offset offset that. Okay, we've got some more questions in the room. This gentleman here, you speak directly. What I'm wondering is how Russia, if it was to be victorious, would actually manage to rule Ukraine. Can, can I tackle that one? Um, the answer is with brutality. Um, this is one of the reasons, you know, uh, Rajon wrote uh, an excellent piece in the New York Times last week, I think it was published or earlier this week, uh, still talking about how Putin has already lost this war. And, and um, I, I'm not sure I 100% agree that Putin has lost this war, but Russia has definitely lost this war. And one of the ways it's lost this war is that to the extent that it has conquered territory, but even if it conquers more territory, it has to govern that territory. And um, Colonialism is not an effective economic tool in the modern world. It is an incredibly costly, destructive economic tool. Um, so it's going to suppressing Ukrainian resistance is going to cost uh, an immense amount of money. And as I said, the Russians will will do in Ukraine what they've done, for example, in Chechnya, which is um, it, this won't be like American occupation in Iraq because for all of the brutality of American occupation in Iraq. We had incredibly tight uh, um, limits on how we use force and when we use force, and the Russians will not have that. So again, people who oppose them will be imprisoned, tortured, and killed. People who they fear in the future might oppose them will be imprisoned, tortured, and killed. Um, millions of people will flee, and then the Russians will bring in people from other parts of, of Russia um, to try to fill those positions. It will be a colonialist enterprise, and it will be um, hugely destructive for the Ukrainians, and it will sap the energy of the Russian economy for decades and decades to come. Just and that's quick, an optimistic view of things. A quick add-on. I'll be very brief, Andreas. I, actually, in that not the New York Times uh, op-ed, Paul, I wanted Russia has already lost the war, but editor <laughs> they always years, do, as you well know on on titles. <laughs> um, you know, there used to be a time when it was thought that there were two Ukraines, a ethnically. Uh, Ukrainian Ukraine, 
and a so-called Russophone Ukraine, where predominantly of Russian, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers, the latter, the Russophone region in the east and the south. I think the war has redefined all of that because the destruction that has been visited upon Ukraine has uh, hit the hardest the very areas that the Russians claim to be liberating, there's no love lost there between them. The Russians have also deported to Russia thousands of children. So I think uh, Ukrainian nationalism has been remade. It's a point I made in this piece. And yeah. oddly enough, Putin will go down as somebody who did something he had no intention of doing, which is remaking Ukrainian identity. That said, uh, Paul is correct that they have enormous brute force to bring to bear. But remember, that in population, this is Europe's fifth or sixth largest country, leaving Europe and Russia aside. In land area, it is the largest. It is not going to be easy to control this. And there is going to be a long period of active and passive resistance. And Ukrainians have a tradition, actually, of partisan resistance that goes back. It's not going to be easy, but if the Russians are hell-bent upon doing it, they will do it with great brutality. I think my best guess is that what Putin wants to do is to hive off four provinces, one of which he already controls almost totally, that is Lugansk, which together with Donetsk is, uh, constitutes the so-called uh, Donbass. He controls about a, a third to half of Donbass. So he wants Lugansk, Donetsk, all of Zaporizhia, he doesn't control all of it, and all of Kherson. And I think that a partition of Ukraine, rather than outright control, is what he seeks. Now, I'm not inside his head, I can't tell you, but if I were him, I would call that victory and go home because those are the provinces that he has laid claim to and enshrined in Duma that is the Russian parliamentary legislation. Okay, we've got another question in the chat room before we go back here into the audience. And by the way, online audience, if you want to unmute and, and show your video and ask a question directly for of Rajan and Paul, you can do that now. Uh, John, uh, is asking a question, what are the chances of the long overdue effort to provide NATO forces uh, in, Uc to, in U to aid the Ukraine's cause? Presumably, uh, they, he means indirectly rather than directly, but uh, please consider both options. Well, I indirectly, uh, NATO forces and American forces have been on the ground for a long time. We don't know the extent of what they're doing, but we know that they're not fighting directly. Volunteer forces from a host of countries have been on the ground. I, I've met people who are, I won't name the countries, but 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 they're but 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 they're there. As for European forces participating directly, I think I'm reasonably confident in saying that the probability is about as close to zero as one can imagine. I don't think that's that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And in fact, the Ukrainians haven't asked for that. The Ukrainians the Ukrainians have said very consistently, right? Give us the weapons, we'll do the fighting. And that's both a um I mean that that's a real a, a potentially realistic strategy. It's it's um it's also like the I think it's the only politically viable strategy. Um and if they got the weapons they needed, you know, one of the one of the commentators asked earlier about, well, you know, it's not just about weapons, it's about soldiers as well. Uh, yes, but of course, if you have better weapons, you get fewer of your soldiers killed. If you have better weapons, uh, I think it's easier to get people to to enlist or to not resist conscription and so on. So the the arms make a uh, make a, a huge um, influence on this. If I can just go back briefly to this question of um, A10s uh, versus F16s, um, uh, yeah, the the A10 is a fantastic um, um, uh, combined arms support aircraft. But its efficacy or its usability is premised on having air superiority, which the United States often has in the war that it throws. One of the really interesting things about this war is that neither Ukraine nor Russia has been able to establish air superiority, which means neither of them has been able to execute combined arm tactics in the way that the textbook says they should. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, why this Ukrainian offensive uh, last spring failed, because they didn't have uh, um, air air superiority to go after some of those entrenched positions. And so this is a way in which this war has been a little bit different from what maybe people thought or expected. Um, Russia in particular has been very hesitant to actually try to attain air superiority because they don't want its air force destroyed and shot down. And so that's just an interesting tactical dimension that I think then plays into the question of what are the kinds of weapons that Ukraine can really use um, on the ground? And I think it's more about... 
um, artillery, um, and especially long range artillery, the so-called um, high Mars and ATACMs, those would have an immense uh, impact if they were given in large numbers. Just one point on air superiority. For me, one of the biggest surprises of this war is not that Ukraine hasn't used its air force. It doesn't have really much of one. Yeah. But Russia hasn't used it, its air force at all. The first thing I thought that the Russians would yep. do put a no-fly zone. Absolutely. And they did not do it. Now yep. I know they didn't do it because just in the last eight days, they've lost as many aircraft. Yep. Uh, two four thirty fours, one A-50, and many others. The losses have been stupendous. By the way, yep. another quick point on how uh, Russians have taken a hit in this war. 25% of the Black Sea's sub ships and submarines are either sunk or damaged, and the Ukrainians have hit targets all over the Crimean Peninsula. Fuel uh, sites, command posts, rail junctions, and so on. Uh, Mr. Ford, very quickly, if I could answer this question. question is, Sashank Joshi of The Economist, whom I know and respect, has said that the war of values and it's for Putin's perspective, it's not a war of territory. What he fears most is spread of liberalism, democracy, and so on. I mean, the, there's a tendency, and I don't mean this with any disrespect to Shashank, but there's a tendency to boil down the war into a single factor of policy. Is it this or that? It's all kinds of things, right? It's about pride. It's about arrogance. It's about the fear of liberalism. It's about a sense of writing historical injustices as seen by the Russians. So we don't have to have an interpretation that says it's this one thing. It's many things. Okay. I mean, going from tactical, oh, we've got a gentleman in the back. Just one question while I'm making my way over there is from a tactical to more existential question. Where or when do nuclear weapons come into this all? <laughs> I might start by saying that I don't, I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that they will be used, by, by which I mean detonated um, in this war. And I think, in fact, the um, neither a tactical nor a strategic case exists for using them. They have been incredibly important politically. Um, Russia, uh, especially I think in the early months of the war, very successfully deterred a, great, a greater Western support for, for Ukraine um, through the threat or, or raising this fear that this could escalate, uh, that if Russia lost, it might use nuclear weapons. Russia um, really helped shape debate in the West very effectively using that tactic, which is why in the, the summer and fall of 2022, um, this, this conversation about F-16s uh, went away pretty quickly. On the use of nuclear weapons, here's the problem I think that we all face. We don't have any way of deductively arriving at a conclusion about when Putin, because he would have to authorize it, might authorize the use of nuclear weapons. Now, we could put ourselves in his, in his position and try to see the world as he sees it as best we can and say, well, aha, it's at this point that we do it. The problem, of course, is that he might change his mind from day to day, week to week, depending on the battlefield situation. Empirically, that is with evidence, we just don't have the evidence that we need to sort that out. But because Russia is a nuclear armed power, and the United States is, and a couple of NATO countries are, nuclear weapons is always lurking in the background. So if you see some hesitation about what to provide Ukraine in what quantities and by when, some of it has to do with bureaucratic inertia in fighting within the administration between those who want to move quickly and those who want to move more slowly. But it's also balancing the support with Ukraine with keeping the prospect of nuclear escalation as low as possible. So it has always figured in this debate. Now, there's not a day that goes by when Dmitry Medvedev, who has acquired a serious problem with alcohol, I might add, is threatening to use nuclear weapons. And I think that that's really not to be taken seriously. Putin, in fact, has been very, very circumspect on nuclear weapons. There's also a question of how would they be used? Because if they use on the battlefield to achieve a battlefield victory, Russian troops would be incinerated by nuclear weapons. If they're used against NATO, the consequences are completely unpredictable for the Russians because it could implicate them in a nuclear war in which they wouldn't come out ahead, nor would the West come out ahead. So I don't think it's a trivial matter, but it's never something that one can say we don't have to worry about. Anybody who says that is not to be listened to because they have no basis to assert it. Just as if I were to tell you nuclear escalation is highly likely you shouldn't take me seriously because I have no way of making that claim with any degree of confidence. 
Okay, thank you, Rajan and Paul. We've got another question here from the audience here in the room. Hi, <clears throat> thank you very much for your talk so far. Um, this latest conflict is just part of an ebb and flow of Russians moving into East and Central Europe and back again. And at the heart, if you um, read about the history of Russian nationalism, Putin's concept of being Peter the Great, reinstating the USSR, and the needs of people in Eastern Europe and Central Europe wanting their identity, uh, much hard-worn. Could you comment, uh, Serhii Plochi has written some very interesting books on all this, and, and it's not something that's talked about much. Uh, it's all about the mechanics of the war, and, yeah. but not on what's actually driving it. The, what is Russian identity and what is Russian nationalism and who are Russians? You care to comment? These are huge questions. And one of the things I, uh, I always point out is that Russia does not know where its Western border is. The Western border of the Russian empire has not stayed in the same place for more than about 50 years since the Russian empire started whether you date that from Peter the Great or all the way back to Ivan the Terrible. Um, so that's a problem. There's no clear historical place to say this is where Russia ends. That's um that's an ideational issue, right? That's a question of how do we imagine Russia? As you pointed out, whom do we define as Russians? Many Russians, Putin clearly thinks that Ukrainians are Russians, full stop. And as Rajan had pointed out, um, Many Ukrainians, to the extent they had any doubt about that, now don't have any doubt anymore. They know they're not Russians because they're getting killed for being Ukrainian. Um, but that's in the ideational side of things. And you're absolutely right to point it out. And, and my point would be that it's, it, it's, um, it continues to be um, a problem because Russia doesn't know where it ends or who it, or who it consists of. The flip side of that is there's a real sort of just what I would call power politics and territory dimension of this which is that no matter where that that border exists at any point in time, there's always that question of what's on the other side and what you do about it. So wherever the border is, it's perfectly rational and logical for the Russians to say, we want a friendly regime on the other side, right? And so you start interfering with the politics on the state on the other side. And if you can't get something that you're satisfied with, you can't get a regime in Kiev, for example, that you're satisfied with, well, then you go ahead and invade and put one there. The problem is now you're going to be thinking about what's on the other side of the border and it's going to be and it's going to be Poland. And we know how that could go. Um, yeah, I, I understood the question also to ask about to be about and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, whoever asked the question about how does Russian national identity play into this? That's a very good question. And it's a very complicated one, because at least since Peter the Great, maybe before that, and in the ensuing years, there's been an, a tumultuous debate in Russia about what is Russia? Mm -hmm. what, what is the Russia's essence and where does it belong? Now, at the risk of being crude in terms of simplicity, there was a historian here, uh, actually Paul is a historian, and I'm going to do violence to, to, you, uh, to, your, to your discipline. There have been roughly three camps. Russia's ultimate destiny is in the West to embrace individual liberty, market economics, and democracy. It should look Western. Russia is a Western country. There are Russians who believe this. Then there are Russians who believe, well, Russia is something really different. These are the Slavophiles. We rest our identity on the church, on communalism, as opposed to individualism. We're not that enamored of industrialization, there's a dollop of kind of green thinking involved in this. And there's a very ambivalent view to the, of it. Then there are the Eurasianists. There's a wonderful article in the New York Review of Books by Saul Morrison uh, recently about this. The Eurasianists actually say, well, Russia is a hybrid of Europe and Asia. And they look back of all things to the Mongol conquest of the 10th century, 11th century, whatever and argue that in many respects, the Mongols left a profound imprint on Russia and that the imprint was not all that bad. And so uh, if you ask, what is Russia? It's not an easy question, they say, because Russia is, is, a, is a hybrid country geographically, 
and culturally. Now, how, how much does this play into the war? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, a, a quick uh, response uh, to, to Ms. Norman Taylor. Uh, you asked the question, Paul has said that um, manpower is a big uh, issue in the war. Indeed it is. Uh, but uh, if it's so big, isn't that the end of the ball game? Again, I'm, 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 I'm condensing your, your question in a way that you may not like. Um, the reason weapons are still important is that the way that the Ukrainians have been able to inflict so many casualties on Russia is because they have had some extremely good Russian uh, Western weaponry. So to offset the numerical advantage, they must have that because if it's a war simply of numbers of men fighting, they have no chance because the Russians simply have have, have more to uh, have more to to add to this. Nav on Navalny, very quickly, is there somebody who can pick up his mantle? This is uh, Ms. Manford's question. Uh, it's an interesting question. Yulia Navalny is an extremely intelligent, articulate, courageous, forceful woman. Could she step in and pick up Navalny's mantle? Yes, but there's a thousand different ways in which the Russians could deal with her, from assassination to not allowing her to come back to Russia. And so I think there's no magic solution where an opposition figure suddenly rises from the ground and transforms the system and puts Putin on the back foot. I think the, the system has a certain durability. It doesn't mean it'll last forever, but I think we should never underestimate its capacity both to co-opt, that is to reward people for compliance, and repress, that is to make them pay for disobedience. Raja, I'm very grateful for you ticking off all the online questions in one go. Very, very commendable. I've, we've got another question here in the room, and then I think we'll draw uh, matters to a close. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, so a, f a few months ago, um, the abortive rebellion by the Wagner group um, seemed really, really significant, just for a week or so. And then, um, um, but looking, I just wondered, looking back now, um, do you think that it's as completely insignificant as it now just appears? Or do you think that the fact it happened and how it happened um, told you, gave you any insight into stuff that is actually happening in Russia and what, you know, what, how things could could develop if there were there was some leadership that that people could get behind. Uh, Prigozhin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head, the, the late head of the Wagner Group, was not somebody who opposed the war at all, nor did he really oppose President Putin. He didn't criticize Putin directly. His criticism, criticism was directed at uh, General Garasimov, the chief of staff, and Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister, and he accused him of being incompetent in running the war in two respects. Too many people were dying, and enough ordnance and supplies were not being provided to the front. So he was very much a pro-war man, but he carried out his rebellion in a way that he became a problem for Putin, and if you become a problem for Putin, you're liable to disappear. But what it flagged is that in certain respects, the Russian military performance has been highly deficient, and the, the rebellion of, of Prigozhin and the Wagner group, which is ex an extraordinary event, I, took me completely by, by surprise. Uh, someone's asked, by the way, about Western intelligence knew the war was coming way before the 24th, and why wasn't anything done? Uh, the Americans gave Mr. Uh, Zielinski plenty of warning. He just didn't want to reckon with that, partly, I suspect, because he thought Ukraine is not ready, partly because it was so mass panic. I don't know the reason, but American intelligence for once was on top of this, and they saw the war coming. Yeah, if I can try to tie a few of these things together. Um, one of the things that the Prigozhin rebellion showed is that the alternatives to Putin might not be very good. Um, Prigozhin was was not uh, um, rebelling because he wanted peace. He was uh, rebelling because he wanted to fight this war more effectively. And so uh, to the question that that um, several people have, have raised in the chat, you know, what happens after Putin? 
Um, this is, you know, a, a favorite uh, topic of debate amongst those of us who debate this stuff. Um, my personal feeling is I'm not sure we can count on a lot changing. Um, as crucial as Putin is, I I'm not sure other Russian leaders besides Putin would have started this war, but that doesn't mean that um, another leader uh, after Putin will be eager to stop it. Uh, maybe if Russia is, if there's a, uh, if the war is stalemated at that point, maybe we look to the analogy of Korea and say, well, Stalin died and then people came in after him and were able to negotiate a ceasefire, perhaps. But I don't think we should assume that we're going to get some kinder, gentler Russia um, when Putin is replaced, because the people who replace him are going to be of the same um, ilk. Um, and so I just, I, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry to to be saying that. Um, going back to this question about w what happened before the war that, that John has raised and Rajan has commented on. Um, We'll have to look more at the history after it's all over. I suspect that all of those warnings did have some impact on the fact that Ukraine was ability on uh, Ukraine's ability to repel that first uh, initial week of invasion. But the bigger point I, I would make is this: is that um, there's a there was a massive deterrence failure on the part of the West, which is had we made it clear to the Russians before this war started the extent of the weapons we were going to del to deliver to Ukraine. Um, it, it might have, um, might have, I can only say might have, might have, have changed their, their thinking a little bit to, to give lots of weapons as we have done is great, but to not have told everybody ahead of time that this is what we were going to do means we really missed an opportunity potentially to deter the attack. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's, we probably need to draw it to All close right. here, but I think, you know, just, just on Putin, I mean, the presidential, presidential election isn't far yes. away, but nobody will, in their right mind, probably will bet against Putin uh, having another long term. And uh, despite the fact he's 71, I think uh, for better or for worse, he's there to stay in Russia. Um, so I suppose the conclusion of our discussion, Rajan and Paul, is that the war in Ukraine will go on and will go on. Uh, and we'll probably be, unfortunately, and very sadly, back again here next year discussing the latest state of the, the situation again. There doesn't seem to be any uh, short-term uh, avenue to peace in 2024 or potentially even in 2025, which is a sobering thought. But I would like the audience once again to put their hands together for an excellent exposition of what you've encountered in Ukraine and what's currently going on on the whole geopolitical uh, level in Ukraine and beyond. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.